The Vic is going to find me a glass of water. Yes. I'm going to read this opening sentence. Okay. I don't know if the microphones are on or not. Are the microphones on? Marcel, you ask if the microphones are on and if they can hear. No. May I tell you how much I appreciate your asking me to share some of my ideas with you. The title of my address is, If You Find This World Bad, You Should See Some of the Others. I would like to confess that I've been asked to cut about two-thirds of my speech out and deliver as short a speech as possible. Upon examining my speech, I find that it is very easy to remove two-thirds without doing any injury to it. <laughs> I even considered cutting three-thirds out of it, but uh, there was some trouble, so I abandoned that idea. The subject of this speech is a topic which has been discovered recently and which may not exist at all. I may be talking about something that does not exist, therefore I'm free to say everything or nothing. I can hardly make an error if there is no such thing as orthogonal time. Orthogonal or right angle time is the topic of my speech. We are accustomed to supposing that all change takes place along the linear time axis from past to present to future. The present is an accrual of the past and is different from it. The future will accrue from the present on and be different yet. That an orthogonal or right angle time axis could exist a lateral domain in which change takes place, processes occurring sideways in reality, so to speak, this is almost impossible to imagine. How would we perceive such lateral changes? What would we experience? What clues, if we are trying to test out this bizarre theory, should we be on the alert for? In other words, how can change take place outside of linear time at all, in any sense, to any degree? Let me present you with a metaphor. Let us say that there exists this very rich patron of the arts. Every day on the wall of his living room above his fireplace, his servants hang a new picture, each day a different masterpiece, day after day, month after month, each day the used one is removed and replaced by a different and new one. I shall call this process change along the linear axis. But now let us suppose the servants temporarily running out of new replacement pictures. What shall they do in the meantime? They can't just leave the present one hanging. Their employer has decreed that perpetual replacement, that is to say changing the pictures, is to take place. So they neither allow the current one to remain, nor do they replace it with a new one. Instead, they do a very clever thing. When their employer is not looking, the servants cunningly alter the picture already on the wall. They paint out a tree here. They paint in a little girl there. They add this. They obliterate that. They make the same painting different and in a sense new, but as I'm sure you can see, not new in the sense of replacing it. The employer enters his living room after dinner, seats himself facing the fireplace, and contemplates what should be, according to his expectations, the new picture. What does he see? It certainly isn't what he saw previously, but also it isn't somehow, and here we must become very sympathetic with this perhaps somewhat stupid man, because we can virtually see his brain circuits striving to understand. His brain circuits are saying, yes, it is a new picture. It is not the same one as yesterday. But also, it is the same one, I think. I feel on a very deep, intuitive basis. I feel that somehow I've seen it before. I seem to remember a tree, though, and there is no tree. Now, perhaps if we extrapolate from this man's perceptual, mentational confusion to the theoretical point I was making about lateral change, 
you can get a better idea of what I mean. I mean, perhaps you can to at least a degree see that although what I'm talking about may not exist, my concept may be fictional, it could exist. It is not intellectually self-contradictory. Contemplating this possibility of a lateral arrangement of worlds, a plurality of overlapping Earths along whose linking axis a person can somehow move, can travel in a mysterious way from worse to fair to good to excellent, contemplating this in theological terms, perhaps we could say that herewith we suddenly decipher the elliptical utterances which Christ expressed regarding the kingdom of God, specifically where it is located. He seems to have given contradictory and puzzling answers. But suppose, just suppose for an instant, that the cause of the perplexity lay not in any desire on his part to baffle or to hide, but in the inadequacy of the question. My kingdom is not of this world, he is reported to have said. The kingdom is within you, or possibly it is among you. I put before you now the notion which I personally find exciting, that he may have had in mind that which I speak of as the lateral axis of overlapping realms, which contain among them a spectrum of aspects ranging from the unspeakably malignant to the beautiful. And Christ was saying over and over again that there really are many objective realms somehow related and somehow bridgeable by living not dead men, and that the most wondrous of these worlds was a just kingdom in which either he himself or God himself or both of them ruled. And he did not merely speak of a variety of ways of subjectively viewing one world. The kingdom was and is an actual different place at the opposite end of continua, starting with slavery and utter pain. It was his mission to teach his disciples the secret of crossing along this orthogonal path. He did not merely report what lay there. He taught the method of getting there. But, tragically, the secret was lost. The enemy, the Roman authority, crushed it. And so we do not have it. But perhaps we can refine it, since we know that such a secret exists kingdom is ever to be established here on earth or whether it is a place or state we go to after death. I'm sure I don't have to tell you that this issue has been a fundamental one and an unresolved one throughout the history of Christianity. Christ and St. Paul both seem to say emphatically that an actual breaking through into time, that is specifically what they say, a breaking through into time, into our world, by the host of God, will unexpectedly occur. Thereupon, after some exciting drama, a thousand-year paradise, a rightful kingdom will be established, at least for those who have done their homework and chores and generally paid attention, have not gone to sleep, as one parable puts it. We are enjoined repeatedly in the New Testament to be vigilant, that for the Christian it is always day. There is always light by which he can see this event when it comes. See this event. Does that imply that many persons who are somehow asleep or blind or not vigilant, they will not see it even though it occurs? Consider the significance which can be assigned to these notions. The kingdom will come here unexpectedly. This is always stressed. The rightful faithful shall see it because for them it is always daytime. But for the others, what seems expressed here is the paradoxical but enthralling thought that, and hear this and ponder, the kingdom were it established here would not be visible to those outside it. I offer the idea that in more modern terms, what is meant that some of us will travel laterally to that better world and some will not. They will remain stuck along the lateral axis, which means that for them the kingdom did not come, not in their al alternative world. And yet, meantime, it did come in ours. So it comes, and yet it does not come. Amazing. I'm going to cut down to here. Okay. If you've followed my conjectures about the overlapping of these alternate worlds, and you sense as I do the possibility that if there are three or four or two, there may be 30 or 3,000 of them, and that some of us live in this one, others of us in another one, others in others, and that events on one track cannot be perceived by persons not in that track, 
Well, let me say what I want to say and be done with it. I think I once experienced a track in which the Savior returned, but I experienced it just briefly. I am not there now. I am not sure I ever was. Certainly I may never be again. I grieve for that loss, but loss it is. Somehow I moved laterally, but then fell back, and then it was gone. A vanished mountain and a stream, the sound of bells, and all gone now for me, entirely gone. I, in my stories and novels, often write about counterfeit worlds, semi-real worlds, as well as deranged private worlds, inhabited often by just one person, while meantime the other characters either remain in their own worlds throughout or are somehow drawn into one of the peculiar ones. This theme occurs in the corpus of my 27 years of writing. At no time did I have a theoretical or conscious explanation for my preoccupation with these pluriform pseudo-worlds, but now I think I understand. What I was sensing was the manifold of partially actualized realities lying tangent to what evidently is the most actualized one, the one which the majority of us, by consensus gentium, agree on. Although originally I presumed that the differences between these worlds was caused entirely by the subjectivity of the various human viewpoints, it did not take me long to open the question as to whether it might not be more than that, that in fact plural realities did exist superimposed onto one another like so many film transparencies. What I still do not grasp, however, is how one reality out of the many becomes actualized in contradistinction to the others.